Heidi. I'm going to have to take off my tour guide hat for a moment and exchange it for a mystery solving tam. Let's get to snooping. Where did that character originate? And like, how did you develop? She has so many quirks. Like, I, I, think, I, was, I think I was born as that character, quite mm-hmm. honestly. And I've just played different vari- variances of her. But John Lutz came to me. He and I had worked together for years on SNL. And he's one of the funniest people on earth. And he called me and just said, what if we did a comedy homage to Murder, She Wrote? And I was like, yes, immediately without him even telling me more. But he was, you know, saying that I could play a Jessica Fletcher type. And we ended up talking about what, you know, that she's gay and that she's still a spinster and she, you know, sort of shares expenses with women sometimes. And and uh, we just the more we talked about it, it was just immediately something we both wanted to do so badly. We do three episodes in a row and it's almost like the three acts of a of a little half hour uh, procedural. I loved the clothes. It just reminded me so much of some of my older relatives that would just always, no matter what, have their cute little scarf and a little lipstick and a little, it was just so up my alley. And I love trench coats and we got all sorts of colored trench coats. And so... It, it turned out to be really a complete and utter joy romp. A little like, st- like post here. I know exactly the woman you're talking about. Oh my God. Know? Like what you'd wear to church. And then my mom would come home or my grandma and they take the shirt off and have a bra on with the pearls <laughs> and then just sit and eat some egg salad <laughs> out on the screened in porch with the bra and pearls. And like this type of woman is maybe going away a little bit too. Yes. And I, I, I love... I love the combination of that kind of woman with the fact that most of those women absolutely do know the score and they do know when they're being funny. They're just going along with the decorum, but they have the little twinkle in the eye. I had a lot of great aunts like that, that, that knew exactly when they were being hilarious and they would just give you the dead eyed look. My mom's the same way. She, she will just look at you after a comment and you die laughing and she, you know, my dad is genuinely a skilled comedy brain. Like he can, he's just a wordsmith and he can come up with really funny things or little songs or different things. But my mom is hilarious in a completely different way where she'll come up with something and then just kind of give the eyebrow. Once they get in their eighties, they're like, I don't play. I am not playing. Heidi, turn away, dear. There's been a martyr. It seems like a lot of characters you write have like a bunch of very specific quirks or just like little like one-off sort of things that they do. Yeah, like they I, love, I love when characters um, pronounce things strangely. I had a woman that took care of my grandma in her home for a while that um, at the end of every sentence would say, and that stuff and that. It was like a Midwestern thing. And she'd be like, you know, oh my God, I go over to Target and that stuff and that. And sometimes they get a sundress and that stuff and that. And my family would never believe me. And then we went to my grandma's funeral and the woman came up and was like, oh, Helen was just so sweet and that stuff and that. And and she just says that at the end of her sentences. And when we would write sketches, the joy would always be like, what's the little hook? What's a little funny hook? The fun thing is once you start writing more series, television or movies, you could write scenes that you see under all of that weirdness. Boy, it must be fun to work here. Although the biggest drawback to working in a theme park is that you must live under constant fear of deadly terrorist attacks. So speaking of SNL, you were there for a long time. And I know you kind of, when you got sort of in the process, you thought you were coming on as a performer and they were like, no, you're a writer. Um, How did you sort of like learn your groove there? And by the end, were you like a seasoned pro? You know, I didn't ever think I was gonna be a performer except when they called and just said, they told my agent, like, we saw her on this tape, Lauren wants to meet her. But so I just assumed, cause I was performing at Disney then and at Universal, and I truly had only done that. I was in my twenties, I got my theater degree. I was in a bunch of plays. I, 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 that's all I ever did. And then I got there and there were so many like-minded people that were performers before that were now acting. And then so many of the actors were my type of humor of those sort of joyful loser characters like the cheerleaders or Bobby and Marty. 
And so I really found my groove in doing characters, which was always my absolute favorite thing to write since I was little. That was my ground of my making. And I just found it at SNL that, you know, we could all laugh all night, goofing around, laying on couches and offices at four in the morning and, you know, on your seventh Coke classic and eating pizza and being silly. So it was perfect. It was a very much up my alley type of style of writing. Go ask your mama. And make sure you listen, cause one thing is for sure, Bobby Fischer's missing, Bobby Fischer. Where is he? I don't know, I don't know, Bobby Fischer. Where is he? I don't know, I don't know. He's gone. They are still such a thing. Like I saw a, a bit the other day about quarantining parents, like where they were pretending to be the cheerleaders and they were trying to like get their kids going. Like when did you know that was like had hit like this like tipping point of success. If you had a recurring character and it started becoming a hit and people knew it, and that was an era, those first few years I was there, first 10 really years I was there, it was like a lot of recurring characters. That was the the absolute bread and butter of the place. Once the audience, since it is 100% live, they look down and if they saw them, if they even saw their little costumes, if they saw their, you know, a lot of times they put a flat so you couldn't see them. But if they saw them or they saw Will come out and they saw his little hair and his little sweater or whatever, and people would scream. And it's like, it's such a unbelievable feeling. And one very specific memory I have of that is I used to write a boy group sketch called Six, a six Degrees Celsius, I think is what it was called. When you tell me that we're through. I did one when um, In Sync was on as the music guest, and they said, "Oh, can you do something where In Sync is in that sketch?" And I said, "Oh my God, yeah, I'd love to do that." So I wrote a song where they were like McDonald's uh, employees dressed, and they were a boy group, and they sang "Hold the Pickle," and mm-hmm. it was just like you know, "Hold the Pickle." Hold the pickle. And do it up I went to the after party. I woke up the next day. We'd always sleep in, of course, because we were all drunk from the after party. I woke up at about two in the afternoon and TRL was on with Carson Daly, I think, uh, on MTV. And down in Times Square was were like a hundred girls with a banner that said hold the pickle because NSYNC was being interviewed. And I could not compute in my brain that I was looking I had just, I mean, I barely still had my clothes on from last night and I turn on the TV and I'm looking at a line that I wrote like four days ago in a sketch painted on a freaking banner all the way down with all these girls screaming for sync. And I just really, that was the first time I just felt that power of when you do those kind of characters where people would remember them. Once more from the top, please. I gotta go, I gotta go. I got a hail a pumpkin coach. Ah! Tell me about making those and like. Oh, that was just what, a I mean, dream. I got to go. Um, the co-op documentary. It really, uh, I am a, an enormous theater nerd. I am an enormous nerd of Sondheim of the, mu- of the musical company. My mother played the Elaine Stritch part in company. So when they wrote these songs that are so Sondheim like, like it was such a fantasy. And then we worked so hard to learn the lines and and learn our parts and learn our harmonies. And then we shot it and I kept feeling like they were going to be like, okay, well, opening night is next Thursday. We're going to go try it in the theater. And I just wanted so badly to do it live and just to do the whole show, like to have it be real. We would go out every night, just like a cast does when you're in a play where you're just getting to know each other so fast. You tell each other like drunkenly after the third night, your deepest secrets, because you know you're going to be like doing a show for months together. And then we just finished. Like we were in Portland. It was like, great, great. That was fun. Ah, We all wanted to get in a van and travel it back across the country. If you win, he's all yours. And if I win, I bring him back to the farm for good. Wait, what? That wasn't the deal. Port, I'm thirsty. That was... um. A, a, a very singular look that they, <laughs> that they put you it in. It was. There were many, <laughs> many layers of, of makeup. I think Planet of the Apes was the only thing that took longer to to layer 
the amount of makeup they put on me. And the funniest thing is that, you know, when I look back, I always played older women. Always. I always have gray spray in my hair. I'd be at a cast party and like, 24 years old and you'd see this picture of me standing there at a cast party and I have, to have like gray spray, but I have a young face. I still have a big round face, but like my skin was like creamy and, and it just cracks me up that the older I get now, when I play those characters, I come in and, and the makeup and hair people do that assessment where they're going to decide what they're going to do. And then they're like, you know, in this, you're going to play like an old prospector, you know, and you're like in the stream. And then they're like, I think you're good. I think you're good. And you know what, what you're wearing is good too. I think what you got to, it's just always really easy now. You either take this check and sell us that copier, or I am gonna cut this puppet's head off right now, Mr. Doodles! No! Clear off! Wait, wait, Helen, you're hurting me! Well, you're hurting us! AP Bio absolutely was a huge thing, because I just really let it rip in that and, and got so comfortable, and I'm so comfortable with Patton as my person to play off of, and Glenn and all those kids are so amazing. Um, and the women in it that play the teachers are just such dolls and darling women. Do you mind I'm reading? Fine. I'm going to sleep. Oh, oh God. Oh, I can't believe I ate those scallops again. Oh, oh. oh Marty. You like doing voices like you're in Big Mouth. You were in Inside Out. How is that experience for you? I love doing voiceovers. I really enjoy it. I love when someone says do that again, but more anxious or do that again, where she's kind of more of an asshole or do that again. Like I love adjusting, you know, that's the part of acting. I know that sounds like such actor stuff, but that is really what I love about it is when a director would say to you, um, can you give me that? But it, it, the challenge, like, can you do that, but make me more afraid of you or make me like, I love that kind of thing. So with voiceover, it's so immediate because you're just there, you're in front of the mic, you read the line and they're like, okay, do it again, but do it this way. And then you do it and then try it again this way. Doesn't matter what you're wearing. You don't have to wear any makeup. You could just <laughs> pull a ponytail back. Um, and it's just very intimate. One of the first things on your IMDb page is a TV series called Super Force, uh, which actually takes place in the year 2020. Um, in 2020, times are tough. This man's tougher. You think that it has come true. <laughs> oh my God. That, <laughs> that's so funny. Cause it was so futuristic and it was like superheroes. And I don't remember exactly what I played. Maybe like a councilwoman or a, I just or don't know a the name. Mrs. A mayor. I think I was like a mayor. I don't, th I definitely don't think I was a, a superhero of any kind, but you know, once again, the, the scold, like super force you better get out of here just all that hands on the hips business i kicked well, a lot of people out of my yard they're uh, stepping on stepping on my tomatoes 